We've got some fresh new young talent doing some things that I know you haven't heard before. One, two, three, listen. Welcome to Finances, your home for all things financial, investment, money, and lifestyle. Hosted and curated by the very talented team of certified financial planners and Burke Britain Financial Partners. This is the Finances Podcast. Uh, I'm Jay Burke. My co-host is back after a long absence, Ben it's been a while. Kemp. Uh, and today's guest is Jake Pittman, Managing Director and Building Consultant at Mance Group. Uh, Jake, thanks for jumping on the podcast with us today. Yeah, thanks for the invite, guys. Uh, no worries. Now, I've got a question before we actually get into anything. I'm going to ask you this, Jake. The name of our podcast, Fine Answers, do you, do you, what, do you understand the play on words there? I, I do, yeah. Okay. Yep. So, correct. Yeah, so I'm guessing someone did. Most people that I've asked said, "Oh, I didn't know finances was uh, finances was finances." No. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. So maybe we're trying to be a little bit too clever with that. It took uh, us months to come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> we outsmarted ourselves. <laughs> oh, there were some horrible names, horrible <laughs> names. But uh, at the end of the day, I don't know whether the name matters much. It's like uh, getting your business cards for your business. Yeah, if true. you if you're uh, if you're no good at business, it doesn't really matter what's on your business card. Yeah, so. correct. Uh, I do know the the feeling with. The word man's group. I was going to say, where people, does that come from? People sometimes go the man's group or you know mancy group, and it's like, oh, okay. So, so you introduced it very, very well there, Jake. Great. Oh, thank yeah. you. I didn't practice it, and you didn't actually give me the uh, phonetic spelling no. or, or pronunciation it was of a it. Test. Yeah. It was a, yeah. Uh, well, we always like to, and you oh, you said you'd listen to a couple of our previous podcasts. Uh, we'll d- we'll jump into all things man's group uh, business and what you do. But before we get there, let's let's hear a little bit about you. Who are you? Where'd you grow up? Uh, where'd you go to school? And what brought you to uh, this podcast today? Yeah, well, you know, interestingly enough, we were just speaking before about the Horsham links. It seems like everyone has a link back to Horsham. And uh, so, yeah, I grew up there for the first 25 years of um, my life. Um, How old are you now? So I'm 37 this year, okay. so 36 at the moment. Um, so, yeah, did a basically completed year 12 there. Uh, going to school, playing sport, you know, part of the community. It was, it was a great place to grow up. Um, and then completed an apprenticeship there um, with uh, Mick and Jeanette Munn, which was, um, you know, going through that work process. And, and over the years, you really look back at the mentors that are part of your, your kind of professional life and you really you really appreciate that. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a great, great part of my life. Um, can, I, can I ask just with, the, with your schooling, yeah. uh, just to pause a little bit on that, you did an apprenticeship, but during your schooling, you know, living and going to school in the Wimmera, what what did you think you wanted to do? Like you you, you did what most people did in the Wimmera, probably you did the same, Ben, where you played cricket and footy and basketball. And but was there anything that grabbed your attention during your school years? Did you did you end up where you thought you'd be? I there was something about construction, so there was something there that I felt like I, I wanted to delve into. Uh, so originally was, I wanted to go in the army, okay. but I wanted to be in construction in the army. I thought I'll get a trade and go that way. Well, um, playing footy. Did the Navy or the army come and do a presentation yeah, at school? They did, but I, I think I had links with the grandfathers in, you know, in the army and there was something there. Um, and mum and dad were supportive, but I think they were scared of, of what that might entail. Um, then playing a bit of, bit of football and, and dodgy knees kind of steered me in another direction. <laughs> And you know you have different forks of the, of the life, which is probably might have been a good choice. Um, so I appreciate my my dicky knee. Yeah. Um, and then so I still had that construction vibe. Um, what, what what did your parents do? So mum uh, mum worked at Spotlight. Okay. Um, so just in retail. Yep. Um, and dad worked for Telstra, so telecom. So he worked there for 25 years. So hard workers, you know. Um, you know my sister and I. So there's the four of us in the family. Um, grew up in Horsham North. So. You know, um, working working class kind of part of town, um, but wouldn't change it for anything. Um, that's for sure. Um, the construction link then was still there at school, and I wanted to complete Year Twelve. It was important. Um, the pressure at school, I felt, is unfair and was unfair about what uni course I was going to do, or what, what university you're going to do. Was uni ever uh, an option? It was on. It was on the cards. I'd chosen a course. I went for TAFE, um, and that was in construction management. I thought um, I had my car picked out of what I was going to drive. <laughs> it was a Saab back then, Saab convertible. And I was going to be driving around and directing people how to build. Well, thank, 
That's like oh, that's like picking your business cards <laughs> and, your, and your podcast name before you've got something to talk about in the business yeah. to run. I'm guessing you, <laughs> yeah. you never got the Saab and you didn't get the Saab. <laughs> what what, 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 what was your? Do you have a? Because I had I have a similar. I had a it was an, an SSU. That was yeah. My that's one. that's actually pretty like just the Commodore. Just I had the, the picture area. of the SSU. Like I had the brochure, the glossy yeah. brochure. I thought that's gonna be my that's car one. on a nursing wage. I'm gonna buy myself <laughs> a, an SSU. <laughs> <laughs> now now I drive around in a, in a trader you. I wouldn't know how to hold on to a hammer. So. Yeah, no. <laughs> Did you ever use your winch or not? No, nah, just for looks that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that didn't eventuate. And then I, I, I wanted to earn some cash over, over the week, um, over the summer, um, before I went off to, to TAFE, um, to Swinburne TAFE, to do construction management. And I started cold calling um, building companies. Was Swinburne TAFE, is that in Horsham? Or is that in no, that was in the other side of Melbourne. Okay. Yeah, it's yep. a Bandura. Um, How was that well, move? I had, a, I had a grandma that lived on that side of town. Did you um, live with her? Well, that was the plan yeah. I was going to. Um, but this cold calling around different companies in, in Horsham just to get this bit of cash, that, that involved getting a work with uh, Mick and, and Jeanette Munn, and then that developed into an apprenticeship pretty quickly. Oh, okay. So I was happy to, happy to go down that path, and I was ready for work. Um, and yeah, but back on that school part of that pressure, it's something that I do, do a talk to the St. Joey's boys every year. Um, so the year tens and just saying, look, there is pressure there, but you know, it doesn't matter what you choose. You can always change things. You can always go to uni. You don't have to go to uni. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, but it is for some people when, yeah. It's, it's that pressure comes on early. Like I remember really? even mm. in year like seven and eight, they're starting to talk about it. And I had no idea what mm. I wanted to do. You, even when you get to uni, I still didn't really know. You still don't know I what still you want to do. I sometimes don't know. <laughs> <laughs> just fell here and just stayed for 10 years. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's bizarre and it makes people question so much. You just sort of got to try stuff, don't you? You like, do. You just yeah. And not, not be scared of, of I'm choosing one direction here. It doesn't mean you're in that forever. Yeah. Some people are lucky. I felt like I had constructed my blood. Yeah. So I was heading that direction from the get go. But, but some people aren't like that. So, and it's all fine. And there's also mm. so many different, like what you're doing now versus what you started out doing is, yeah, Correct. same industry, but pretty different, isn't it? Yeah, so. yeah. So I won a scholarship to go overseas and that was a big opportunity. I never wanted to go and travel. I was, you know, I had cousins that we were traveling around the world. I'm like, well, I'll, yeah, I'll just stick in, stick in Australia, thanks. And then something changed. Um, and I was given an opportunity, an application came in the mail and I just, something in me said, I'm, I'm going to get this. This is, I'm going to win this. And, and we did. Um, and then my met my now wife just before I left to go overseas. Um, so it all happened pretty quick. And then two years over there and, you know, traveling to 20 plus countries and experiencing all different, all the different culture. So and what was the scholarship? So it was basically to give trades an opportunity overseas. Um, and it's a 60 year old um, foundation, so the Australian Overseas Foundation Scholarship, um, to really give the opportunities. Cause they, they realize all these other academics have opportunities to go overseas and, um, and do those types of things but um so yeah this this basically just gives you a bit of a kick or an excuse to go you know they'll pay for flights and a bit of setup costs um but it just gives you that so what did you actually do so i went over there and worked okay yeah worked for two years and, and traveled um and just got different exposures to different different techniques and different buildings and um and architecture and, and now did rachel go with you met her just before you left yeah so i went over um Found a house, set up, you know, a different apartment. Wanted to stay away from Aussies. Yep. So I went, headed north. I just got off the train, backpack, yep. and headed north. Something was telling me that way. So you stayed in London? Is that where yeah, you Yeah, yep. Um, ended up in Angel Islington, so just north of um, centre of London, which was a really good spot. I don't so know no, nowhere near the walkabout? No, I wanted to go opposite <laughs> opposite way just because of the, um, I'm ochre enough as it is. So I wanted to, wanted to stick clear. Lived Prop with some crazy Italians um, for a bit, and then lo and behold, Got, a, got an apartment with two Torquay people. Yeah. Uh, it was like, nah, it, was, it was brilliant. Some of the best years of our, our lives. So. Yeah. So two years over there, then you came back. What happened when you returned? Came back, yeah. So um, had links with Lions Construction, so a commercial construction company in Geelong. Um, and once again, we said mentors before. So I had a lot of mentors through that business and um, experiences and exposure to different, different construction there. And that's when I really got into more commercial stuff. Um, and so got domestic and commercial background um and then yeah what, what makes you jump out of the construction side and into the the contract and the the overseeing of it like what 
at what point do you cross over? Yeah, I, I was um, last this week actually got got notified that I've been um, been approved for my commercial builder's license. So it's been a bit of a process to apply for that, and part of that process was you submitting application, and it was a really good experience to look back and look at what what I've done and how it's kind of eventuated. So it's a good question, and it it really kicked off with probably the last big commercial job we did. Um, trying to control defects and contractual issues early and be proactive and something kicked kicked in there a bit of a spark and I think I always had something that I wanted to maybe have our own business or you know because grass is always greener it's, yeah. it's easy to run a business and you can take off time whenever you want you get and business you know, cards yeah and, and a sad <laughs> <laughs> So I think that, yeah, that last project we did, um, you know, it was a 96-bed aged care facility. So it was a lot of rooms, a lot of, you know, you make one mistake, you're probably going to make 96 straight up. So you're trying to really mitigate those processes. Um, and then my, my family, or my parents were retiring or getting closer to retirement um, and moving to Halls Gap. So they were starting that build process. And then, you know, they, they couldn't find a designer. They were trying to find someone to design the the house that suited the block but you know was in their price racket bracket um, and then they went through the builders quotes and trying to liaise all that so I took charge of that and more project managed it uh, from a distance um, but then that kind of that spark lit of oh hang on this could be maybe an angle here and then through the build process too of walking through and going, oh, I wouldn't do it that way maybe we'll flag this and trying to do that in a in a way that wouldn't inflame um, you know, parties and stakeholders is, is difficult. Definitely. Um, but yeah, that's how the business kind of kind of started there. So, so when yeah. did? Oh, thanks, Peter. <laughs> Coffee's mid podcast. This is always good. Coffee Thank you. It's good. We can edit. Thank you, Peter. We can edit Cheers. Peter out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just a, the, the crunchy chewing of yeah. the no, cooking. No, okay. That's okay. Mm. We've got a great uh, podcast editor, Luke Massey. Thanks, Luke, yeah. for uh, editing out the ums and the ahs and the drinking and yeah. eating on the podcast. We don't do any ums and ahs. There was a well. There was a great good pause just before. <laughs> but I went, that's all right. I won't even notice that deer, ever. Deer in the headlights. No, nah, it's all good. It's all good. Uh, the, so the, the business itself, you had that experience with your with your parents, which again I'm sure you Ben can relate to, uh, and I know myself having built a house before. There's so many things that you it just you are like a deer in the headlights when it comes mm. to uh, building your first home or even a second or third home. There's things that you don't consider because it's not your wheelhouse. How did you take that thought around? your parents' experience, and when did it actually formalise into a business? Yeah, so back in, in 2017 at Formley, so we're six years just gone in, in August, um, and so that's when we were registered as a business and things started to really, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start to get the plan and processes, setting our, you know, mission and our values and, and really what, you know, Rachel and myself are really, we like to do is try and think bigger all the time. So not start something, we want to get things in place and processes and systems and, and think about the big picture first and that slow burn and investment into, the, into what we do, I think is now starting to, to come off and it's like, we're glad we put that time and energy and that slow burn at the start to, to that, where we are now. That's actually, not, that's actually uh, not a, a very common thing for people starting yeah. their first business. Like mm. people having concentrating on the why. I know we joked about it before that people start, when they start a business, they get their business cards and they think that's the start of the business. But that idea of actually having a picture of what you're trying to do, the vision, the mission, and mm -hmm. working back from that like and making sure that the process is in place. Where, yeah. where did that come from? Was that your commercial background or did, what did Rachel offer in terms of uh, the contribution towards how you establish the business to begin with? Yeah, well, Rachel's amazing at the, she's the marketing background. So she's got that in her. And then I've, I've got a bad case of trying to be perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a fine line between, you know, yeah, being perfect, but then being actually productive. Um, but her marketing background definitely helps. So that, that even generated, you know, the brand that we've got, you know, the branding guidelines. You know, my cousin, cousin did the design um, and set out some clear design of, of, of colors even. You know, and then that forms into what fonts we use and yeah, all that crazy. Yeah, yeah, all that, and and we still look back at that and go, well, no, that's not us. That's, that's that needs to go back to our branding guidelines. What are we at? 
you know, that investment back then, we're still going back to it and using it. So, yeah, I think her marketing background definitely, definitely helps there. Commercial background, definitely, from a contractual point of view of trying to get things right. Um, you know, construction is hard. People make mistakes. I've made plenty. Um, but it's trying to learn from that and how we put, you know, stop gaps in along the way. Um, and then that's what's built, you know, three main cores of business with contract reviews, you know, before people enter and in. Because um, usually the dispute will arise and then they look at the contract. It's too late then. Um, let's look at it first before it's entered. What, what percentage of people are doing that? Like what percentage mm -hmm. of people are getting support around uh, their contracts? Very, very low. Uh, I do about 50, 50 a year. Um, and that's, I'd spend about six, eight hours going through through the contract because everything's specific. There's a lot of general clauses in there, but each build is specific to that that block, that client and their, their drawings. So you've got to look at it. We look at it from a builder's perspective, not a legal perspective at all because I'm not legal practitioners. Um, so we, we're very clear with our clients in that respect, but a lot of legal practitioners don't know the building side. So they're kind of, they know the law, absolutely, but you know, what that SAW report reflects in that engineering drawings or... So what are the types of things that you're I was, looking... I was going to say, there's an example, Rachel gave some, I'll probably butcher it, but you'd read yeah. one and it was yeah. about the, I think it was water connection and they had quoted to go like under the road and yeah. shut the road for a day and or something, they traffic management. And when you looked at it, then you cross-checked it and you said, yeah, they don't need to do that. Like the water connection's on the same side. Of yeah, I just... Uh, tapped into dial before you dig and got some reports and like all well, the main is on this side so that's there's a four five six grand saving straight up yeah you know so yeah is it up oh, it's something weird that I'll, I'll read something and it will you know raise my yeah raise it will kind of I'll go, oh, i'm gonna look into that a bit more i think and then you come back to facts simple as that yeah so any any large costs or anything that's, that seems a bit unreasonable, it's like, oh, that, that's intriguing. Haven't heard of that before. Let's look into this. And then, then there it goes. Yeah, yeah. whereas you and I pick that up, Jay, and we've got... No you, idea. You just trust that process. Yeah, I can think of yeah. three or four items just like that in my build that I... Again, it was not until, not until we were done and we're in the building. The biggest one... I had a, bit of, a little bit of digression. The height of our doors. I actually didn't... On the, the rear doors of our sliding doors of our house... I didn't know till we were actually in the house. They were actually in the house, done and dusted, that they were, uh, you know, a foot lower than the ones at the front. And <laughs> it was it was in the contract, but I just hadn't picked it up. I just hadn't had the conversation. It was one of those things that uh, I just totally missed, and uh, it was it was my fault. But if I had someone saying, "Hey," These, these doors are uh, lower than the front ones. Is that is that what yeah. you want? Because uh, that kind of doesn't make sense. I would have said no. Thanks for picking it up. Yeah, it, is, it is funny that the dumb questions I ask. Oh, I ask a lot right. of dumb questions. So I'm like, when I haven't asked the, the dumb question, it's come back and gone. Oh, wait, how did that not get picked up? And you're like, oh, I thought. Mm. You never think in construction. You just gotta <laughs> never assume. It's always back back to drawings, back to contract and spec. So contract review was was one of the three core elements. What are the next? Yeah, two? so our main core is, is the stage-by-stage -stage, uh, inspections throughout the, the build process. Um, and that be, be from a builder's perspective or a, or a homeowner. Um, so yeah, five typical stages in a build. So pre-pour before the, the concrete gets poured, uh, the frame, uh, the pre-plaster, waterproof fix, and then the final. So yeah, we, we go in, um, we have a set checklist which was developed basically when I was back on the tools. You know, we used to have these internal checks. We used to write a list on a stud in the house. Yep, make sure we put those connections in and, you know, um, put the noggins in here. And, and that was our internal checklist. Feels like that, that, that the more volume uh, built home, I suppose you'd say, um, doesn't have those oversights. I was going to ask that. Reviews. Is that what's driven probably the need more so is the change in what the construction industry has undertaken in the last I don't know, decade, 20 years, like where the volume build and people are impatient, like people can now expect their home to be built in I don't know, 20 weeks or something. So that obviously creates, you know, there's efficiency, but there's also corners that get cut. There is, yeah, it's, there's a fine line. I think, I think we're all guilty of, of wanting things at a price, but 
at a price, things are affected. You know, we can go into a supermarket and buy the same can of, of beans. You know, it might be double the cost, but if we spent 20 minutes reading that and researching the company, we'd find out that we probably should be buying the dearer beans. Um, it's similar with that with everything. You know, so the consumer has to probably be educated a little bit as well. Um, but in saying that, there is minimum standards, and then that's what we we look at. So we look at the minimum standards and the requirements. Um, we look at the, the contractual obligations of all parties, and then you know specifications and things like that 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 um, flags flags issues and defects and trying to flag them early. Yeah. So there's there's not a not a bigger knock-on effect down the track is, is really critical, and that's what our checklists do. Is that why it's so important that you probably come in at that? Pr you know, you're there from the outset, like more so that if you come in halfway and it's, yep. you're only going to see half of the issues. Correct. Yeah. So some people get us in for a fine. We can be engaged at any stage. Um, there's no issues there, but the earlier we're engaged, the more we'll probably identify and, and be proactive in that respect. So. How many people do you think currently take the opportunity to get the pre-inspections versus not? I would say it's it's probably a 50-50 now. Okay. It's quite significant, especially in the last two years. Um, I think more Melbourne-based um, people are very wary of it and it, it's very common. Um, but down here, it's 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 just the given, okay. basically. So it's becoming more, more popular, I suppose. Um, there's a lot of companies out there. It's not a registered uh, or a requirement to have a registration. Um, so that's what we're finding trying to educate clients again we're looking at the the two cans of beans and you know, why is this one's this price or is it this price well if you delve into it you know what what are the qualifications mm. of the people doing inspections and you know have they set checklists and do they go back and re-inspect because what we include we love to go back and all right it's good to have a report that's you know 100 pages that's great but is it being actually fixed or is it just said it's being fixed so yeah, yeah. It's interesting, I was thinking about just the cost of living pressures and whether or not it's one of the things that people kind of skip on at the moment, thinking, well, can't really afford to pay for that inspection or that pre-inspection. But the way I would think about it, and you're probably the same, Ben, and I'm sure, definitely sure you would be, Jake, that this is one of people's biggest investments. Like if it's their principal mm -hmm. residence or it's an investment property, it's a pretty significant asset that you want to make sure that you maintain the value of and that you want to ensure is right, as close to perfect as it possibly can be. So I'd suggest it's an expense very much uh, worth undertaking. It is. It's, um, you know, the third core of our business now is, is the defect and the dispute kind of process. And that's, it's, it's one we've held off on, on entering because it is, there's so much emotion by the time something's gone wrong and not been rectified properly and you know it could be a two years by then that someone's been trying to get something fixed and that could be from a builder's perspective or a, or a homeowner um, the stress and energy that goes into these things the people say i wish i had have been proactive i just wish i had have had someone you know through the build process without na obviously we're not naming names or anything like that but in terms of common what are the most common things that end up in dispute? Like what are the things that sort of are, are flagged as, as hard to resolve? Is it, uh, waterproofing is a big one. So there's usually a leak or a, you know, a big effect there. There's waterproofing, you know, balconies, um, being coastal to you know, wind-driven rain. It's, to find a leak is, is, can be difficult. Uh, so you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars trying to trace where is this coming from and who's whose issue is this, you know, who's caused this? So they're common. What I find is typically it's it's a minor problem that's then gone probably a little bit toxic and it's escalated and may not have been dealt and handled correctly. Um, and then that's knocked on to further, you know, we can get called up to do a full inspection. Um, we can be instructed to find all the defects. It's not not fully enjoyable because you you know what you're there for and yet we're paid to do that and so we're, we'll find the, all the big ticket items we possibly can and that goes into a list because we've been instructed to do that um where the first issue it was just a minor issue now it's turned into a you know hundreds of thousands of dollars so yeah mm. yeah um now i think you uh the connection originally with uh man's group and us was that you, you, i think you might have done some work for Peter, my father. Yeah, That's correct. Right. Yeah, he was just he wanting some, some advice or some, you know, um, things that were going on um, with his house. Yep. Yeah, so, and just to assist and look at the facts. We always pair it back. 
Um, and that's what we're very proud of, of doing, all the team does. Um, right, let's go back to drawings, let's go back to spec. Um, you know, what's tolerable, what's not. Um, some clients might be wanting more than actually what's required. So some builders find us, they thank us as well. You know, there's that definitive line, that black and white um, approach that we have. Um, it's, it's basically, we're in the middle there. Yeah, yeah, I think having that level of independence, yeah, I suppose. It's the key it, word, I think. Yeah. Of. yeah. It, it uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important. I, think, I was thinking about this from a financial planning point of view. We talk about this kind of ad nauseum on the our podcast about uh, the relationships that we have and the people that we work in conjunction with and that it very much is a collaborative effort. You know, we're trying to make sure that we work closely with those other professionals that we cross over with because yep. we, you know, we will cross over with accountants and solicitors and uh, mortgage brokers and all those types of things. But we cannot, and I think for the client's benefit, and I'm, sure, I'm assuming it's a, the same for yourself, that you want there to be a seamless collaboration between those professionals, not too much tension. I mean, the tension's really the last resort, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Um, things can be interpreted differently too um, from reports, but the whole team are very approachable. So you, it's pick up the phone, have a discussion, you know, what's written there might not come across well, but how it's delivered then to meet up on site. Let's talk about it on site with all stakeholders um, and run through it. Um, the kicker we get is, you know, there might be supervisors out there that might not really like, you know, getting these big long lists of, yeah. of issues and defects, but when we get the referral from, oh, I'm such and such a sister, yeah, and you go, yeah, okay. You know, we, we're striking cool. They want us to look after their families or all their close friends, and that's that's really our our kicker and, and reward. There, we know we're doing something right. Um, yeah. The I was thinking about your the evolution over the last six years, from looking at your mum and dad's place to uh, you and Rach setting a vision and a mission. What what does Mans Group look like today? Like in terms of. Uh, how does it look different to where your vision, you, the, way, the way you thought the business would be? Where are you today in terms of I don't know, number of people, the, pe the amount of people you mentioned, sort of the number of contract reviews you do, but what sort of quantum of work are you doing today, six years after establishing the business? Yeah, so um, personally still doing a lot of hours, which is, is always good. Um, it is reducing, which is great. Um, and my role is changing, but from a business perspective, you know, there's eight in the team uh, with Rach and I. So um, we're pretty proud of, of growing that, um, you know, just last week we celebrated Dane's four-year and work anniversary. You know, for a six-year company, we had some of the four years, which I think is great. Um, so, what's the mix of the team? Are they in terms of admin or bill uh, 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 builders or what are they? What yeah, are they so there's five of us. Five of us from the assessor's point of view and building consultants. Um, so we're all registered building practitioners, um, and then there's three in the office um, that kind of job share with Rach, um, so Chris and, and, and Nadia. Um, and they, they, they do more the admin, set up the jobs and get that process really, really clean. And then it's a really handover to, to the guys. And from day dot, we've always had our own clients because I basically copied and pasted what I used to do. I used to run around with 70 clients, um, which I couldn't do now. Um, I wouldn't even want our guys to do that because it was, you know, it's eight days a week, it really yeah. is. Um, but yeah, the team run around 30 to 40 clients each um, and that's, that's a really nice connection that's followed through. So, you know, someone might go past their house and be fretting on, I've seen this cracked bit of timber. Um, or you ring, ring the assessor, ring the consultant. Um, they'll either get back to you straight away or, you know, send them an email and, and they'll allay that, that kind of fits. Like, I, it's all good. I've made a note in the, in the job file. Um, I will look at that back at the next inspection. I think, relax, it doesn't sound like anything too significant. And even that is just like, oh my gosh, I would pay anything for so this. So that stuff seems priceless. I know when mm. we, from our client perspective, they'll call you about something and they just, they're a bit stressed. Yeah. And it's, often it's not even an issue, but they don't know it's not an issue. So you just can have that conversation, give them that peace of mind and everyone just carries on. Yeah. And that's what they pay for more than sometimes the complex stuff, isn't it? With, yeah. the, with the contracts or yeah. documents. Like they just want to be able to hear their, hear their concern and have it, you know, you know, allayed and they're, they're good. So 
it's yeah. yeah we do a lot of that similar stuff i was thinking as you're saying that reassurance yeah big, yeah big support just you're there communication's key um and having good systems behind you to do that as well um once again we invested from the get-go on you know a, a program that it's it can be infinite now but at the start we we're like oh, this is eight thousand dollars <laughs> a year for me it just didn't didn't, didn't, it didn't make compute. sense yeah. no but we're like now it is you know it is is paying back in in dividends there but um yeah you know 220 clients on the books at the moment um so those 220 clients are they for anywhere in that stage from contract review to pre-inspection to uh Dispute. Uh, dispute, yes. Yeah, yeah, correct. So that, that could be builders as well. Um, so we work for Enso Homes, uh, local Geelong builder, and Livonics Homes. Um, so, yeah, that any stages there um, of those five stages or dispute or or complex ones of I've got this going on, can, I, can you come have a look? Um, there's always something in construction, that's the good thing about it. There's so many, so many angles and avenues of, of issues, sadly, or, you know, complexities that, there's always something to look at or, or see. But, yeah. So for someone listening to this podcast and thinking whether or not maybe they've got, uh, maybe they're, they're, they're getting ready to build, maybe they're halfway through a build, maybe they've got some concerns about a build that's already been completed. Is there a point, I'm guessing that earlier rather than later is best, but is there any, uh, is there any stage you don't want people to come and talk to you about it or talk to you about their uh, concerns or queries? Not really. I mean, you've got... The best time is during the build um, because you've got the builder there. Um, as soon as the handover does happen, it is harder to get people back. Um, so that's probably a little bit of advice there. Um, you know, they've got the warranties. Um, so the prescribed period that, that action can be taken against a builder is, is the 10 year period. Um, so that's one thing for people to keep in mind. Um, there's a bit of confusion there. Some people think six and a half, seven years, but that's the insurance side of things. Um, it's more that 10 year period from from um, handover or consent So if someone was wanting to get in touch with Mans Group, wh yeah. where can you be found? How do they get in contact with you? Have you got a website? Have you got yeah, a client yep. portal? Absolutely. How do yeah. they get a hold Mans of you? Mans today is probably the best best point of view. Um, or our, you know our phone number. There's someone usually usually on the on the phone. So oh three five two double o nine two ten, and you'll speak to to one of the, the awesome team in the office there. Um, and even they're really good. It's amazing the reviews on online. You know, the guys, we, we do put in quite a fair bit of effort and probably the more hours. But in the reviews, it's like, oh, Rachel, Kristen, we're, we're lovely during the build process. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, it happens here too, doesn't <laughs> it? <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> remember Teresa's name, but. <laughs> yeah. I, I've poured in 100 hours and, you know, the girls do a great job, absolutely. Um, you know, but my bottom put in four hours and they're yeah. getting, the, getting the glory. But anyway. So just with that, I mean, uh, Google reviews, like things like reviews, uh, super important in this day and age. I know that uh, more and more people will want some sort of uh, endorsement. They want some sort of uh, sort of uh, social proof, if you like, yeah. that, that people are legit. Um, mm. People can jump online, check out your Google reviews. Yeah, Google, Facebook, um, something we've really we pride ourselves on. I mean, you look through it's all five stars, or you know, there's a few few uh, bogus ones in there, which yeah. are always interesting to respond to. Um, uh, but the actual reviews that are in there, some of them go for pages. You know, some of them really pour their heart out of, you know, explaining about what we did and and just and how the process was. And when you read them, and we you know have our team meetings, we we'll read out a couple of them and. That's what keeps us going. Yeah. That's what Dane was talking about last last week of you know, job satisfaction is, is huge. I think that's a big thing of why we still have our own clients. We have our specific clients because you can see the job through. You can get you know outcomes for your for your client, whether that is a builder or a homeowner, and that 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 really says it all. They're not yeah. just a number. They're a person with a story. And yeah. I think building a home is, is a bit like when we do. You know, we're doing the financial stuff. It's, it's one of the biggest things people will ever do in their life like not many people build 10 homes like they might build one yep two and they usually don't know too much about it do they so they need someone to guide them through it and just see it out from start to finish one of the questions i had and again this might be uh difficult but say someone is looking to build or do a big renovation like where do they start like they don't even know where to start with a builder like what would you suggest someone does to start they go i don't know 
do I jump on Google? What what would you suggest someone does from the the start through to just get the ball rolling? Yeah, I think a good design is is great. It's a bit of a, a, a couple of prongs. You, yeah. you need to have a a few builders in mind and maybe a couple of designers of what you you like um, from an aesthetics point of view. But then to have builders input is also important or a consultant's input of you know if that if design some designs can be tweaked slightly and make the build a whole lot more easier and actually make it buildable so builders might come in and give some great kind of guidance and then so there's a little collaboration there so the design is very important um and maybe with a bit of, bit of buildability kind of guidance is is key and that can you know, good design flows on yeah. and, you, and you have to you do have to pay for it so it is an investment and some people once again can of beans yeah you look at two two prices and go, mm, I'll go the cheap design, but then the flow on you pay for from it that, yeah, yeah. the builders you know, come up to issues or you know, there might be variations that are generated from that. So I think this is where potentially there's that overlap between like people making a decision because I mean, building a home is a fairly significant financial decision. If I mean, if a client came to us, we'd be trying to line up. The, the financial ducks if you like I was thinking that I'm like uh, people say oh we're thinking about building and they go like how much do we or, or buying as well like, how much can we afford to spend and then they've got to really work out what they want and then work out what they you know what's a negotiable what's a non-negotiable and back through that process but when they're doing a build it's, it's really tricky to know you, know, you, you go and look at a house down the road and it's got a value on a price on it like there's the, they sort of locked into that Whereas there's a lot of unknowns when they go through that with the design and the build and things. And as much as there's a contracted value, like it's, as we've talked about, there's always, you know, things room for blowouts and, mm. pl- and, and unexpected. Um, so it's always interesting with you, where do people start that process? Sometimes they do it completely backwards. Like they have gone and bought a block of land, but they haven't even thought about what they want to build or, you know, can they afford to do it? I'm just trying to get my mind around what's the best order of that from the construction side of things. Yeah. Um, probably depends, which is probably the case for Yeah, for and that's the thing about construction. <laughs> everyone, everyone does have an opinion or there's yeah. all different scenarios and it, it, you're trying to pair it back all the time. But, you know, even buying a block, what's the orientation? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's a big one. What? Yeah, what, you want a pool, okay. Well, this shaded side here or this hot side here. or How's it going to work? Yeah, so, sloping blocks and yeah. around here. That's yep. a lot of that. I think that willingness to do due diligence and go in, like again, everyone's different personalities. I'm, mm. I'm probably more on the conservative side of saying, "Hey, I need to line my ducks up." I'm, I'm, my wife would call me a procrastinator. I'd say I'm very considered, so I will want the yep. data, I want I'm the similar. information, yep. and then I'll make a decision. She's very reactive and would say, "Just buy the block." And she, again, that's worked well in the past. But I think the combination between sort of reactivity and also having this is where we would probably say encourage people if you if you've got a significant decision in your life a financial decision go and speak to someone be prepared to actually you mentioned about getting different opinions and knowing that there might be some cost involved with actually getting those opinions and getting that oversight but the end result the end result will actually hold you in much better stead like having i had a a client meeting yesterday where i was sort of talking about value and the value that uh, is added in terms of getting financial advice. And some of it is probably very similar in, in your world, that some of it's quite quantifiable. You can actually say, you know, if we don't dig up the road, it's going to say four grand. Yeah. Right? But there's there's the element which is peace of mind and around relationships. And that is up for the client to decide, the individual to decide about the value that they place upon having a a group of professionals around them that can actually guide and direct them in the right manner. Again, I'm very biased, and again, I'm. A, well, we I'm, are biased as a business because that's what we like to do. And you know, we've had, you know, I like working with buyers advocates and stuff like that because they can come in and just again, it's that third party intervention and just look at it and just look at the facts, take the emotion out, and tell you how it is. Which is sort of again for the existing property that they're buying. That's where they fit in. For you guys, it's more that build side of things, and I think that's where people need help because it's complicated absolutely yeah couldn't couldn't have said it better that yeah. is, is it spot on uh any other questions ben no i think that was my good question i like that question road, so. yeah <laughs> and, and it, it is interesting again we talk about this a lot but that overlap between 
you know, we're having many, many diverse businesses and people on the podcast, but the, the common theme for everyone in business doing well is the importance of relationships and the importance of collaboration. And so, you know, for anyone out there listening and, and thinking, as Ben said, they're contemplating a build or they're contemplating a sig- significant financial decision, whatever it might be, take the time to get some support. Take the time to get some some good people around you and uh, be encouraged and trust uh, word of mouth. That's why things like uh, Google reviews go on, check people out, yeah. listen to this podcast, share it uh, widely. If you know someone out there that you think could benefit, I think it's uh, it's super important. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to close with? I know we haven't, we'll probably need to get Rach back on because uh, it sounds like <laughs> Rach does all, all the work behind the scenes and you've She's, got the glory of coming on the podcast. That's right. yeah, she I'll, threw you in here very quickly. She, mate. she did, mate. Um, yeah, no, no, it's been, it's been great. Like we said, it is a relaxed chat. Um, and yeah, we're always open open to chat for people. They need to contact us. Give the give the office a call and yeah, talk to us about any any issues or, or problems or you know, ideally it's proactive because that is the best way. And um, yeah, that's it. great. Well, Jake, that's thanks for coming on the podcast. I look forward to. I'm sure we'll do a round two, maybe a round three with Rachel here as well. And uh, more than welcome to have any of the other team on board. Uh, yeah, I'm sure this this one will be well received. Anything property wise, we know it's it's, yeah, what, it's hot topic. Hot topic, it? yeah. Always. Anything lending, property, construction, investments uh, in property, uh, it's always well received. So again, Jake, thanks very much. It was great to chat. Anytime. Thanks, Cheers, guys. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you're keen to understand more about how financial advice could benefit you, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Burke Britain FP or Google Burke Britain Financial Partners. Check out our client reviews, testimonials, and make a time to meet one of our certified financial planners by clicking book now on our website. Thanks for listening. Any information contained in this podcast is of a general nature only. No account was taken as to the objectives, financial situation, or needs of any particular person. Therefore, before making any decision, business should consider the appropriateness of any information with regard to their particular objective, financial situation, needs, and seek independent advice from a licensed professional specific to their circumstances. All right. That translates to don't be a moron and act on what some random person says on a podcast. Take personal responsibility, do your homework, ask questions and speak to an actual human that knows what they're talking about before you do anything. PP Financial Solutions Proprietary Limited Trading is Burke Britain Financial Partners are authorised representatives of AMP Financial Planning Limited AFS license number 232706.